morning. Welcome to Spirit in the Hills Lutheran Church this fourth Sunday in Advent. Whether it's your first time with us or you are back again, we are grateful for the gift of your presence in worship. And we are so glad to welcome you today. A few announcements as we get started. I'd invite you to open up your bulletin to the inside of the back cover where we've got a handful of announcements. Um, you know, as it is, the beginning of the fourth week of Advent, Christmas Eve comes this Friday, and we have a few different ways and opportunities that we're celebrating Christmas this week together. So tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. right here, uh, there will be a quiet Christmas, a service of comfort and hope. In some places, they call these longest night services or blue Christmas. Uh, we know that the season doesn't always feel merry and bright for everyone, um, and so this is a calmer, quieter, more contemplative service uh, that still celebrates Christmas, but also recognizes all of those different emotions that come this season. Then on Wednesday, uh, come and sing with us at Front Yard Brewing on Bob Wire Road. Wednesday from 6 to 8, we're doing beer and carols at Front Yard Brewing. Um, the, that, that's the description, right? So come and have something to eat or drink. Um, there is also in-house brewed root beer and lemonade. Um, so it's not just alcoholic beers and beverages. So we'd invite everybody to come. Um, come out to Front Yard Brewing at 6 o'clock. Come ready to sing. We've got some songbooks. Bring your friends, um, and we will sing in the year. Like Buddy the Elf says, the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. And then Friday, Christmas Eve, we have two opportunities to worship with us. At 4 p.m., we'll be outdoors, uh, weather permitting, of course, and at 6 p.m., we'll be here in the sanctuary. Both of those will end by candlelight. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women! And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. In this fourth week in our Advent through Epiphany series, Close to Home, uh, we're talking about what it's like to seek sanctuary. So you've heard some of that language already in our worship, and you can see those words on the front of your bulletin, seeking sanctuary. You know, I re remember uh, when I was little, I had a recurring nightmare. Um, it was maybe loosely tied to an episode of the TV show, Are You Afraid of the Dark, that I was probably a little bit too little to watch, but I had a big sister, so I got to. Um, and I would have this recurring nightmare that this man in a creepy mask was out to get me. 
Um, and I would wake up terrified, um, night after night, month after month. Um, I can still, I don't know, if, uh, this might just be me, right? But like, I can still sort of picture that face that showed up so many times in my dreams, um, or that, that mask-covered face, I should say. And when I was scared, I'd wake up, and I'd bust through the doors to my parents' room and hop into their bed. Um, whether I was taking a nap or asleep in the middle of the night. And I'd hop into their bed and pretty much go right back to sleep. But that place was like a sanctuary for me. Just like knowing and probably, you know, as they're sitting there getting kicked in the ribs by like a six-year-old, um, knowing that they were there next to me and that I could feel them. I knew that I was safe. I found this place and maybe even more than the place, because I don't know that their bed was actually any more safe than my bed was. I was with these people that gave me a sense of safety and comfort and respite. And I was next to those who I knew loved me, no matter what. Sanctuary is something that we seek out when something frightening or difficult to understand or dangerous or upsetting to others comes our way. Sanctuary is a place we go to and a people we go to where we are kept and held and loved and safe. So Mary, having received the news that she is pregnant with God in the flesh, Heads on her way somewhere. Because, you know, you see, Mary is young and betrothed, but with a marriage that is yet to be consummated, and now pregnant with a kid. And it's probably not all that difficult to wonder what people are thinking of a teenager pregnant outside of wedlock. What people are thinking about Mary... Maybe even what's going through Joseph's mind as he tries to understand what's going on in this incomprehensible situation. I wonder who Mary might turn to, and she leaves to find sanctuary with her cousin Elizabeth. She finds sanctuary, a place where she can be held, where she is greeted with joy. Because this, after all, is good news. Though this news to Mary at that moment may not have felt so good as everybody was giving her dirty looks. As she felt like she didn't fit in. She finds a warm welcome with Elizabeth and a reassurance that she isn't crazy as Elizabeth confirms the angel's story and says, this is my Lord whom you carry. And finally... Mary, safe, having found sanctuary among Elizabeth, can respond to what she has heard. And what breaks forth is song. One of the longest, if not the longest, kind of depending on how you want to count length, monologues from a woman in Scripture. And I mentioned last week, you know, we, we, in Luke's gospel, we get like John, uh, stories about John and then Jesus and then John and then Jesus and then John and then Jesus. Except for here, where Mary's song comes before Zechariah's song, because he's still shut up where he can't talk because he didn't trust God. He couldn't believe it. And maybe Mary couldn't either, but it seems like she could because... Mary breaks forth in song, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. It, it grows the Lord. Just as Mary had the Lord growing. Mary breaks forth with this response where she is assured of the future. It's this prophetic song. She is the first person to offer these prophetic words, a prophetic song in Luke's gospel, highlighting that reversal, right, where Zechariah's song comes next. 
And Mary uses past tense verbs. So in our English translation, they're, they're perfect tense, which is like a past action with ongoing implications. All right, here's your grammar lesson for today. A past action with ongoing implications. In the Greek, they are not in the perfect tense. They're in the aorist tense. They're in the, they're in the normal tense of passive, which means they've already happened. Like they're done. It's not done and still happening, which I think like theologically we might say done and still happening. But for Mary right now, all of these things that she's saying God will do through Jesus, she says them as if God has done them. They are completed already. Such is her faith and trust that God fulfills God's promise. At this moment of proclamation, Mary speaks of salvation already completed. It brings us to that paradox at the heart of the Advent season. Christ already come into the world 2,000 years ago. And Christ who will come again. And the same paradox at the heart of our faith, God's kingdom come already in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and yet not here in its fullness, as there are still remnants of sin and brokenness around us. We are people who live in a now and a not yet. And you know what? I think one of the interesting things about this stage of pandemic life is that we might understand that now and not yet a little bit more. You know, I keep wanting to say like, oh yeah, because we've like made it through this thing. And it's like, no, we're still going through this thing, right? We've made it to the end. Oh, but there's a new variant and it's not quite the end. Go get your booster shot. We're, we're now through it, but not done with it. It's now and still to come, the end of this pandemic. It's now and still to come, Jesus the Christ. It's now and still to come, God's kingdom and what is it that God has already accomplished and that God is still accomplishing and bringing to bear into the world? A grand reversal, a toppling of systems of the world that keeps some on top by placing many on the bottom. The rich don't need to be more filled. They're already full, despite their constant drive to gain just a little bit more like a certain young rich fool will encounter later in Luke's gospel. It's the hungry who need filling. And the hungry in need of being filled, God has prepared for them a feast beyond riches. The powerful, the kings and the governors and the high priests are knocked from their high places where they forget what everyone else looks like and what it means to see the image of God in their neighbor. And the lowly are uplifted where they can finally see what is around them instead of being crushed down to the ground by the burdens of each day. All of this happens as the one more powerful, as Jesus lowers himself to be born among and live with and bring good news to the ones in the lowest valleys. Things are turned upside down. Mary's experience of sanctuary enables her to dream and trust and see how God is already at work providing a kingdom where all can seek sanctuary, where there is not a top because the mountains have been brought low and there is no bottom because the valleys have been exalted, a world that is about to and has already turned so that all can experience safety and welcome and compassion and justice and love. And there's even more to come as we participate in this kingdom already and become homes and church buildings and families and churches and communities where others can find sanctuary and be filled with bread and the word of the Lord, where rest and safety abound, where all can have sanctuary as we take part in the reversal of oppressive systems by working to feed the hungry and to end hunger by working to support those experiencing homelessness and bring an end to homelessness, by working to make sure everyone has enough as those of us with more than enough are bold to share our second coat. So even as we return to the one in whom we find our sanctuary, the one in whom we find our home now and forever, let us become a sanctuary. Let us become a home for those who need it most. And we will.
the help of God. I can't describe the way I've been feeling Everything all turned around inside my head Longing to find some magical sign The key to my deepest desire The home that my body has left I've waited on the fixies Despite the lovely leaves to no avail I've tried to find my voice like Zachariah But it comes out weak and pale Can we build a place for all the lost too long to be? from their home, search for a room and a bed. Snow fell against the light of a star. Without any offer or invite, he came to give life to the dead. Just 